an editor and a co-founder here at uh, Tortoise. Um, uh, if this is your first thinking back uh, in our newsroom in 2020, then a uh, very happy new year. We wish you a roaring 20s. And um, if you've not been to a thinking before, um, welcome to Tortoise. Um, we are not quite uh, a year up and running. We started, have we still got the backing track? Sam? No worries at all. <laughs> we, we, well, I was going to say, we're a new newsroom. We're a slightly hipper newsroom. We do news with a slight, you know, musical overlay, which I hope you enjoyed there. Um, the, the idea uh, of, of Tortoise started out actually in 2016, um, when there was so much argument about the news. And rather than actually weigh into the discussions about impartiality or fake news, the thing that really struck us was that we were all so busy racing to to chase the latest story, to, to break the next headline, that actually was finding it harder to understand the forces that were, the, that were reshaping our world, that were redefining the way we live every day. And so we've developed this format of thinking, and the idea of it is essentially to take a news conference and uh, an editorial meeting and open it up and make sure that in the course of the coming hour, we listen to as many voices in the room to try and understand what's happening, and in this case, on a subject that we know is important, but that many people like me really don't understand. And that is AI, and specifically this morning, the usage of data. So this is our version of CES. If you didn't quite make it to Las Vegas, uh, we're offering you a coffee, a croissant, and slightly shorter cues. So thank you, thank you for coming. Um, the way that a thinking works, if you don't uh, know, is that we really want to hear from you. And, and typically, that's because we want to see if we can generate new ideas, hear story leads. In the case of the work we're doing on AI, is it's actually built around the index that Alexandra Musavizadeh, my partner here, and her team built, and we launched at the end of last year. And, and when we launched it, we looked at the, the race for dominance if, in AI, if you look like. We looked at country by country, who had the greatest preparedness for AI. But one of the questions that emerged on the day of the launch was, is there a way of looking at the ethics of AI? Is that a measurable uh, commodity, if you like? And one of the key elements of that was data usage. And I suppose what we were really interested in there were a number of different things. One was public awareness of uh, data, uh, prejudices that exist in data sets, um, ownership uh, of uh, data, and uh, the, the uses and applications of that, uh, of that data, and the over, overriding risk, if you like, that when states intervene in technology areas, they do so two to 10 years late. And is there a way to avoid that kind of inevitable statism? So that's the background to this. A thinking, just so you know, has only one rule, which is uh, no questions. And the reason for that is, although we do have some very sage and experienced people up here, we also have a lot of very sage and experienced people uh, in the room. And we want to make sure we hear from as many people as possible. Tell us your experience of this, your, your point of view, rooted in your experience uh, or expertise. Um, like all newsrooms, we are an argument on the way to a deadline. We finish at 9 o'clock. You'll see that Agatha, our tortoise, is making her way across the screen. When she gets to the end, she's done, we're out of time, and the question of AI and the future usage of data has to have been resolved by then. So don't uh, sit on your hands or your thoughts, uh, weigh, in, um, uh, weigh in early. Um, and one other sort of uh, act of courtesy, you'll see there are mics hanging out, at, hanging down, and we've got some uh, cameras too, so these things are, are recorded. What we tend to do is do a cut down of them so that they can uh, inform what we do in our podcasting and, and audio in particular. So I'm going to start, if I may, you may have seen in our uh, Tortoise app this week, we have just focused on one story, which is Apple. And the idea was to say, let's stop reporting on these tech giants like companies and treat them as countries. And think of them as, as, if you like, nation states. And so through the course of 2020, we're doing this series called Tech Nations. And we're trying to understand what's the government of Apple? Who runs it? How does it operate? 
What's the structure of its economy? What's its foreign policy? What's its security policy? What's its cultural affairs? And I suppose the one thing that's most interesting about Apple is that in the years since 2011, when Tim Cook replaced Steve Jobs, and it's clear, I think, from the reporting we've done over the last six months or so, that this is undeniably Tim Cook's company now, one of the really fundamental things that's changed is that Apple has gone from being a company singularly devoted to innovation in product to a company that has a corporate vision of itself, that's interested in its overall social and global outcomes. And that's perhaps enshrined in what you would, in a country, call a constitution. That, that, that not just in the events that happened in San Bernardino in 2015, but actually in the drafting by Tim Cook of Apple's values, it set out what, if, in effect, are its, are its first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments. And its first amendment of its constitution is that privacy is a fundamental human right. This is quite an extraordinary thing, if you think about it, that you have a corporate entity asserting what should or should not be in a national bill of rights. And you may say that this is a convenient piece of corporate positioning against the likes of Facebook and others, but it's clearly a value, a principle held dear by Tim Cook and, given the nature of Apple, now every other Apple employee. So the question I wanted to ask first for the room was, who here agrees that privacy is a fundamental human right? Who thinks it's a qualified human right? Or who thinks it's, an, if you like, an element of the social contract? It's part of our political system, but it's not an essential human right. Who thinks privacy is a fundamental human right? Ooh, quite a few. Uh, two. Who thinks that it is a qualified human right? <laughs> yeah, all rights are qualified. Very good point. But, and who thinks it's a, an element of the social contract, i.e. it depends on the country and age you live in? All right, well, I'm going to go to you, sir, if I may, because you were the one who was like, yes, it is a fundamental human right. I uh, what, what, what? you in that case, because I wavered <laughs> towards, the, uh, towards the final option. Uh, so what's your name, sorry? Uh, my name's Ben Stafford. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any hugely fixed views on the matter, really, and indeed I'm here to learn more than going to contribute to anything useful, but... Uh, yeah, in general terms, the, the idea that one should have the right to privacy is a fairly fundamental one, and I'd like to know some pretty good explanations for why you'd give it up before it became a norm that you would give it up. Who, who was on the side that this was a... that this was not a fundamental human right, that this was something that was essentially free? You, madam, yes, sorry. Um, yeah, well, I guess... What's your name? Sophie. Sophie. Um, in cases of security, like, you know, in some court cases, I don't know about this, where they've had to go into people's messages and into, especially like WhatsApp, which is end-to-end encrypted, and there's an issue about that if governmental courts need to see messages from people, then I think that they should be able to do that. And do you, and on, for example, questions of uh, not just national security, but even government policy setting, do you think if, if the NHS is going to be able to behave better by, if you like, scraping large amounts of our data, would you like them to be able to have that regime on an anonymised basis? Yeah, I think in the case of individual health, I guess there's a difference between individual privacy and corporate privacy. Yeah. Um, I think individual privacy should always be anonymised. Yeah, you might have... Well, I, I just think the... So, so the what's key, your name? Priya yeah. um, The key question there is, is anonymity, because uh, we are not going to get progress on very key issues of our time, and you, you cite one of the most important ones, which is health if we can't uh, use data sets in a safe and secure and uh, ethical manner to um, make sure that we're researching in the most optimal way. So I think that has to be a focus on anonymity there. I would agree however, with what Sophie was saying around security. I think that for me is the reason why I didn't go for the first option that you cited because you know, we cannot, um, sadly, live in a world where we assume people will use privacy for good. So the basic, just, just out of the list, so the basic sort of San Bernardino case where the company says we're not going to open up the iPhone to help the FBI, were you on Apple's side or on the FBI's side in that case? So I think um, the challenge there is how do you, um, it's the classic challenge of how do you use a backdoor for good only? Yes. Because the reality is, is that most backdoors that you open up 
for a government to use, a hundred or more actors around the world will be able to use that for nefarious purposes. So um, I think it is right that there should be a way for law enforcement to cooperate with the large tech companies. However, I don't think we've identified what that way is in the most effective way to avoid uh, back doors being opened that would threaten the security of the broader populace. Yes, sir. That's why it's a social construct. Uh, Dan, Dan That's why it's a social construct, because you have to kind of establish the values and norms around it. And historically, we've, we've always done that. We've always told stories, we've always shared. There's always been a degree of where we've kind of opened ourselves up as our, you know, ourself and given of ourselves to a certain level of society, whether that's kind of, you know, through work or through uh, relations or, or anything. And so that's why I'm very much in the, in the social construct rather than uh, privacy as an absolute right. So, James, I agree, but comes down to use again like I work in financial services and it's very very clear for us that it's not just black and white you can and can't it's what is the use and if it's financial crime then it's completely carte blanche to be able to look in there and understand what's going on and make sure that the data is as transparent as possible to understand and, and stop financial crime but for commercial development it's the far other end of the scale right it's as anonymized pseudonymized or no use whatsoever and it's that, it's what, what is the purpose? And obviously there is some malicious intent sometimes within the world and you have to account for that, but it's, there's a scale of use depending on, uh, a scale of um, transparency depending on the use in my mind. Which, which would suggest that the position is, is essentially like that, i.e. that it's a social construct, it depends on the usage, and that's how we determine Well, I think it's, it's a bit more than that. It is a right to, to privacy, therefore companies should be obliged to put, put in place a system like that that protects uh, as much as possible, so in the, in the lenses of uh, again, commercial development, you, know, you should have the minimal amount of your data being used by companies to do you know, targeted advertising, whatever it may be, but in the cases where it's security and, and others, then you know, you're going to be... Um, well, uh, well, 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 let me just one other thing, before I come to Rob, if I may in a second, I just want to get a sense of who's more worried about state intrusion into privacy or corporate intrusion into privacy. And so let me give a very sort of simplistic overview which says that, if you like, we know that corporates are extremely effective in scrutiny of data, but not very accountable. And we know that governments are, in theory, through freedom of information, etc., accountable, but, you know, to your point, Grim, not necessarily either very effective or even secure. Who, who is more worried about state intrusion into individual data, and who's more worried about corporate intrusion or use of data? State intrusion, state usage, corporate. You can offer both options. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's right. That's the all-you-can-eat uh, uh, um, buffet of, uh, of data intrusions. Listen, um, Rob, if we may, I am, uh, I'm, I'm here partly to host a thinking, but chiefly to plug Rob's book, <laughs> chief, chiefly for the, for the reason that it's got the brilliant title, Rage Inside the Machine, uh, and as anyone who's written the book knows, that that's 95% of the battle to get something that's as good as that. Rob, um, Edit Smith, as you know, you've worked a, a great deal in this, in this job, and the, and the title of the book, or the subtitle, The Prejudice of Algorithms and How to Stop the Internet Making Bigots of Us All, yeah. t tackles one of the sort of central issues about concern that we've got, obviously, which is around the prejudice of data sets and the misleading nature of data sets. So, so will you just allow us to cheat a little, tell us what the book says, yeah. but specifically on one of the key elements about data, this issue of prejudice? Well, the thing about data, uh, the reason I say algorithms are prejudiced is partially to be controversial, but, but because I believe it's true. And uh, the reason they're prejudiced is because effectively what AI does uh, and I want to make some comments about the word AI because I've got a room for the journalists and I think I can do some good here, <laughs> is um, uh, what AI does is it simplifies and generalizes from complexity to simplify conclusions. That's effectively when you're a guy who designs algorithms that do things like that we call AI, that's effectively what you're doing. You're figuring out how do I simplify sufficiently that I can derive generalizations. Now when you simplify and generalize about people, you run into very particular kinds of problems that have existed since uh, here at UCL, not very far from here. The, the eugenics faculty was started at UCL at the beginning of, of UCL. 
So, um, you know, simplifying and generalizing about people has always been closely tied to some very negative things. However, simplifying and generalizing about people is useful, but it has to be, uh, uh, you know, that it has to be mitigated through human ethics and human understanding. And, and unfortunately, uh, we're in increasingly seeing uh, AI doing generalizations and implications about people that I think have very negative social effects and are largely out of human control uh, because of scale, because of intent, uh, and other things like that. Now, I, the words I want to say about AI, uh, since the thing has AI in the title, I think I can go for this, is usually in a headline, if you substitute the word computer program for AI, you do no damage to the headline whatsoever with regard to its information delivery and make it slightly truer, All right? So you, AI, it's in the 50 years the term has been used, over 50, almost, uh, I guess it's almost 70 now, since it's, it started being used in 1950, if I'm remembering correctly, maybe, maybe 1955. Um, that term has meant lots and lots of different things. I think the best way to say what it means is uh, computer programs, algorithms, that have, the that have the pretension of imitating some special human quality. Right? And that special human quality can be called lots of different things. Intelligence is one of those things. Uh, other things are sentience, consciousness, etc. You know, um, uh, and they are algorithms with pretensions. Because ultimately, AI is much simpler than people think, think it is. It's also at a scale and a speed that makes it entirely in impossible to understand. So that's the thing. Simple and complex at the same time. But, but can, you just, can you just sort of pause there for us and yes. just give us a sense of, if you like, not how good AI is, but how bad it is. I, how unreliable do you think it is, Rob? Uh, unreliable, it, this is the thing that's complicated for you, and I'll, I'll use the Google mam mam mammography example. Everybody probably would have said that, seen the headline that said uh, effectively uh, that AI can now read breast cancer scans better than human beings. Uh, advice on headlines about AI never say better than human beings in the headline because usually it's misleading. And this, in this case, it's entirely misleading. What, what's going on in this study, uh, which comes ultimately from Google, is effectively they're doing retrospective analysis on biopsied cancer. Uh, oncologists will tell you retrospective analysis and real clinical trials, trials are entirely different things. And one of the reasons is because the data that you, or for which we have the biopsy cancers was, in fact, data where we dug into people because the doctor said we needed to dig into people. The second thing you need to know is that uh, the outcomes of getting more cancers diagnosed are not necessarily positive. It's not entirely clear that more mammography, in fact, it's sort of clear that more mammography will make the problem worse both in terms of the labor intensity applied, in terms of the quality of people's outcomes, and in terms of the quality of people's life. Uh, so, so this idea that it does better than humans is what do you mean by what humans do? Because humans, are, human doctors are trying to get good outcomes for breast cancer patients. They're not just looking at scans and saying, oh, do we see any cancer here? And, and moreover, uh, there's a really great thread on, if you follow me on Twitter, I can actually point you at it, but it's a great thread where an oncologist goes through and says why the study is misleading. And uh, the thing about AI, what, what is AI doing that's bad? It's misleading people about fundamental things that need to be done in life, uh, from medical diagnosis all the way, the way up to how we vote. It's also changing the dynamics of our society, uh, the uh, social media. Uh, effectively, I think the job that's been most impacted by, uh, by algorithms has been editing news, because the curation of news for most people, it's largely done algorithmically through the presentation order of their news feed. Hmm. And I think that's doing great harm because algorithms simplify and generalize. They're simplifying and generalizing about the audience, and then they are delivering content based on those simplifications and generalizations in a way that's very uh, not diverse. Um, and, and moreover, it's a way that's exploitable. Because I think what's going on now is informational segregation and digital gerrymandering. I think that's a, the, and, and that's why Cambridge Analytica. Just explain both of those things, sir. Uh, informational segregation. Effectively, we're being, by algorithm, divided into subcategories of people uh, in these simplifying and generalizing ways that often, by the way, align with normal ways of segregating people because that's how data analysis works. It goes from simple features 
to characterize complex phenomena. Simple features come down to things like gender and color quite often. So it's, it's, it's dividing us into categories of people uh, at massive speed and scale. Then we're deli it's delivering different information to different people. Now, riding on the back of that, you can very easily go and say, okay, here's a group of people in a particular electoral district who I want to sway 100 of them to vote differently. And I'm going to figure out a way to categorize those people I need to, to, uh, to sway. And then I'm going to deliver a particular kind of content to them relentlessly. And certainly, this goes on writ large and in the small uh, electoral example. Uh, constantly, we're very aware of it. Without the algorithmic infrastructure that we have, and I, it is algorithmic infrastructure, it's not just the network, it's not just the social network, it's the social network algorithms. Because ultimately, uh, at the scale of modern social networks, the only way to do these things is algorithmically, and algorithms inherently simplify and generalize. So effectively, that's, that's, the, that the, dam that's the biggest damage that AI is doing. Okay, that's great. Well, let's, I'm going to come back to that, and before I come back to the room, I'm just going to come to you if I might, Dave, because, um, Dave, with the work that you do at Dark Trace, if you like, Rob's describing uh, accidental uh, public policy problems that are created by the algorithmic age. Your job is actually to deal with explicit and intentional malice enabled by AI, or at least supercomputer programs. Can, can you explain a little bit about what we should be worried about or what you're trying to track so we can understand what should be done about it? There's the shift to the amount of data that has been lost by all of us as citizens and the ability to weaponize that data that's been lost with the introduction of machine learning or computer programs is it feels like we're at a real tipping point of some significantly greater harms in an era where cybersecurity is already pretty bad. Right? <laughs> uh, so we're not starting from a good place. I'll, I'll give three colorful examples. The first one is um, all of us have lost at least, between us all, 1.4 trillion passwords. I know that because down the road there is a company called Securio <coughs> who have found criminals trading with each other over 1.4 trillion of all of our passwords. This is, this is globally? Globally. I mean, still a lot. <laughs> um, why does this matter? Because, you know, we all pretend we have long random passwords, and reality is we don't. And you can look, in this data, you can look people up by name. So I've looked up all the lost Dave Palmer passwords in the world, and some of mine are in there. But a lot of those passwords, and this is a real one, is I love Kathy, just a, a short string. And then you, if you were malicious, you could dig into that and say, who is this person? And how do they generate their passwords? And they're all, I love Kathy. One of them's not very courteous about Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is, there is a, now a lot of data about us, about how we develop our secrets, or well, not how we develop it, what are the secrets that we use? And from that, using the simplifying and generalizing that Rob's talked about, we would be able to predict people's passwords now, given just their name, or their name and address would be far more effective. Name, address, football team they support, and the car that they own, largely available via Facebook, would give you an incredible ability to predict passwords, and please everyone, Stop putting your sports teams and your pet names mm. as your passwords. So that will be an enormous tipping point. When we have relatively uncomplicated systems that are very effective at guessing people's passwords just by knowing their, say, their name and address or name and religion, mm. cybersecurity is going to get a lot worse. Another thing that AI is changing is relatively rarely discussed, but one of the things that criminals do in order to get inside your organizations, for instance, is hack the video conferencing units in your meeting rooms. Because if you're going to talk about something really sensitive, you probably do it in your boardroom. If you're a law firm, you invite clients into a wood-paneled, lovely room with great coffee, I imagine. And there will be microphones and smart TVs and video conferencing units all over there. And we've seen for years and years those systems being abused. But as I have joked many times, Criminals don't become criminals to go to more meetings. <laughs> uh, um, but now they can stream those conversations out to a machine that will transcribe it for them. It won't be perfect, but it will be accurate enough. Um, 
If you've been frustrated with your voice assistant, <coughs> then um, you'd perhaps be surprised that the real-time things like Alexa and Siri feel frustrating, but when you look at offline transcription where you're prepared to wait a couple of minutes for the results, the results are actually pretty incredible. So now we could go around the world hammering smart TVs and video conferencing systems that are very poorly protected, but some of the weakest technology that we all own, and start collecting up what people are discussing, automatically having it transcribed, and go and search that data corpus for things that are interested. Interesting. Could be court cases, could be unannounced mergers and acquisitions. We are not ready as a society for a world in which we talk to each other and say, is it safe to have this conversation in this room? I used to work at MI5 and GCHQ. I did that for 13 years, literally had that conversation. And I know there are some friends here as well that have been in that world. But normal society, we're not ready for. Is it safe to, to have this conversation in here? Those of you who own particular brands of TVs, including Samsung's, if you looked at your terms and conditions, there's a line in there that says don't have a sensitive conversation in front of your TV in your lounge. Mm. In, the, in the Samsung... Terms and conditions, because they've got microphones in the TVs. And they don't want to own the risk, right? They want the, some lawyer somewhere has put a, a line into the terms and conditions <laughs> saying don't have your sensitive conversation in front of here. Is that These, what we got? Samsung. Is that <laughs> <laughs> well, you're recording this anyway. We're live streaming. Um, so before we get into like AI that deliberately itself is trying to take advantage of other people, what we have is AI and data, or machine learning and data, really able to supercharge <coughs> crimes that have been going on a long time, mm. and the. I'm, I'm normally quite optimistic, but with cybersecurity in general, it doesn't feel like the world's making progress. We don't have improved norms on what states do to each other. We don't have improved norms on collaborating in order to capture criminals. And if they're able to, say, increase by a factor of 10 their efficiency, then, then there's going to be more rocky roads ahead for us. And, and Dave, you said there were, there were three. There's, the, there's, the, there's this oh, the capacity e one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a that? long one. Are you from, is that okay? Are we uh, okay for hearing more things that are sort of slightly depressing first thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Dave, keep going. Yeah. So if we were all to get together, clearly this is a room of super smart people that are very well connected, and we were to create a criminal enterprise, um, then the number one thing I think we should build, and we definitely have the skills here in the room to do it, would be a program capable of reading all the emails in someone's inbox, looking at the different people they communicate with, and replicating their, their tone and the content of communications they send to particular people. How I would contact most of you who I don't know would be very formal. John, who I've met a number of times, might be more friendly. We've had conversations in the past. If we'd emailed in the past, maybe John uh, and I talk about, again, Great British Bake Off or a particular football team or whatever. AI now is smart enough. Machine learning now is not smart enough. Machine learning uh, pattern recognition is good enough to replicate my tone, to see that there are points of content that two people have discussed in the past and create an entirely fake communication, almost certainly with an attachment in it, because that's the way the infection will spread, and send that to someone else. Rather than attacking their technology, that kind of is what's going on, but what's fundamentally happening is we're using machine learning to attack the trust relationships between human beings. I'm sure if we did this started with James, we could take over everyone in James's address book relatively quickly, and he's probably very well connected. But then it moves out exponentially from there. And we would be able to blast our way across the world very quickly, or if we wanted to be more targeted, maybe we'd go into HSBC and we work our way around the bank until we find the people that, I don't know, set the limits on the ATMs. Whatever our objective is, <coughs> we'll attack the trust relationships between humans to achieve our objective. And then we just pick whatever malicious intent that we want to do to make money. <laughs> All right, views and thoughts, yes. Sophia, um, I already had that in some way, in a light touch version. Because you, you, you already had it? Yeah, yeah the scam going on where 
I think they scrape their email addresses, and especially if you look on, on your email on your phone, you only see the name. And it looked like an email from my CEO, who like a really close relationship with, asking me to buy, I think, iTunes cards. Yeah. Um, I thought slightly odd favor, but still in the remit of possibility. And it was kind of trying. She's like, I'm going into a meeting, you can't call me, but like, just. And you start having this conversation, and it's perfectly fine. Tone is really on point of like your actual conversation that you would have. Mm. That's human beings today. And that's a really expensive operation, having those human beings in the right t awake at the right times doing that. Another thing people are doing is just stealing old emails and replying to one of them. And you see all of the email chain. But when a machine's generating it at machine speed, but everyone in your address book, if one Wednesday, no one who's receiving email in the world could believe that the emails are, are genuine or not, did you, real did you buy the iTunes no. cards? <laughs> <laughs> but trust me, I was at PC World and they were like, are you sure you are? Mm. Oh, I see. You went, oh, you, you went. It was a Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I, I, I'd like to, we, we sort of cannily call this session data rules with the intention that we would think a little bit about the extent to which data rules, but also try and begin to game out what kind of data rules should be developed. And so, I'd love to begin the second one, think a little bit about what kind of systems for data ownership or regulation we think should exist. And before we do that, can I just see, are there any other sort of points or thoughts that people have on the back of what Dave was saying? Yes, sir. Right, yes, sir. John. Yeah. Uh, my name's John. Um, we have been in touch about British Bake Off, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th uh, this conversation has taken a very kind of dark turn, and I would just like to kind of make the contrary argument, which is that computer programming to use its proper name, can be a fantastic force for good in uh, checking human bias. I think we have several millennia of very good evidence that humans are less than rational actors, um, and that uh, I think a lot of computer programming can be fantastically good at checking those human biases, whether it's in the court system, whether it's in the allocation of insurance, whether it's making loans to people, and as we're seeing in Cyprus at the moment, the, the human justice system uh, is not a particularly oh, gosh, yeah. uh, fantastic thing. So um, I think there is a counter-argument to all of this, which is, sure, a lot of these elements are very scary, but used properly, and I use that phrase very carefully, this can be a fantastic force for good. Sorry, if I could jump in, I think that, you know, I've made a living off AI for 30 years, so, so I'm, I'm not anti-AI, but I, I do think we, we need to identify uh, the human area, the human areas where human intervention is entirely necessary, and <coughs> and, and make sure that human intervention is always there. Uh, can computer programs help people? Uh, of course they can, and, and they they do substantially. But but you know, uh, it's not as sophisticated as people think it is. This is absolutely true. And um, when it intervenes in things like human justice, I become concerned because I think that those are particular. The, the reason that we have a jury of our peers, right, is because uh, effectively we don't believe that the programmatic system of law, law is effectively a programmatic system, and it's it's an algorithm as a sort, right, and we do not trust that algorithm to administer justice, right? We do not, as a matter of. Uh, of strong intent within the societies that we found it. Let's not make the mistake of saying that just because it runs on a computer, now we should trust the algorithmic system to administer justice. Yeah, but because I, that might be yeah. a better system. Yeah. Sure. But John, can I just ask one thing? How do you, I think first we're all in, inevitably fearful of the new, and so there's an element of that, the, the conversation, or if you like, the thinking skews that way. But if you were to take your starting point, which is that the technology is, is, in, is sort of inherently progressive, that it's actually going to benefit human outcomes. How do, you, how do you actually cement that into systems of governance or oversight? Uh, law. Uh, and uh, um, there's a whole movement in America, which I'm sure you know infinitely more about than I do, about arguing should you create a kind of federal drug administration for algorithms? Should they be reviewed yeah. by their peers? Should yeah. they be testable and contestable in a court of law. And I think that's quite a good place to start. Sure. I mean, the whole ethics and AI regulation field is a, is a, gr is a massively growing area. Uh, but there is the concern about ethics washing, 
uh, in that field of great concern. But you, but John, you would argue you you'd be in favour of an FDA sort of a federal data administration or something. I think I would. Yeah. Like um, there's there's some there's a lady over here. Yes, I'll come to you, Shalom. Hi, I'm Anna. Um, just to kind of uh, the point that John made, I think I guess I'm seeing a lot of media coverage, which is all about the concerns that AI or machine learning is uh, well is is raising in in various areas of, of society, and not particularly as kind of good coverage as to all the goodness that is happening within AI. AI has been around from 1960s, the same sort of statistical methods have been around for a very long time and just recently have been kind of uh, accelerated by various technological things that um, have happened such as cloud computing and, and ability to computation yet scale sort of crunch lots of data. So I guess the point um, for me and some of, the, some of the things that have been quoted are as misleading as the kind of things that um, have been, uh, we, we've raised as being quoted as um, kind of wrong that AI can do things better than humans. Within this sort of filter bubble, just on the media point that you made, actually the algorithmically driven news feed, uh, there's a report by Reuters that says that has um, exposed individuals to more sources than if it's curated by a by a human. Now, you know, the, the sources and our bias towards how much we trust sort of a polar, polarized views of sources is a different matter, but there's also, I guess we need to be cognizant of applying our biases about whether things are good or bad, just because the coverage and the concerns are big and it kind of fuels our view of AI. Some of the things that I've noticed is media always covers AI with a robot typing on a computer. <laughs> and essentially that sort of says, your job's on the line, you know, they'll end up ruining the world. Whereas I think we're very far off from sort of that doom and gloom dystopian future. Do you, just, just have an interesting, Anna, because I, th I, th I thought Rob's point about where, where data was distorting existing public behaviour, particularly around news, obviously was really interesting to me. Yeah. At the moment, it seems there's really very little clarity on whether or not we are being exposed to more sources, which we inevitably are, thanks to the internet and access to volume of sources, or whether we're being exposed to a wider variety of views. And I take the point that journalism has long been its own filter bubble. We have something called Fleet Street. Yes. You, know, you could be a mirror person or an express person. Personally, is your experience of the media that you now feel as though you get a, access to a wider <coughs> perspective of views, not sources, but views? Personally, I do, but um, I've worked in media for a long time, so... Right. <laughs> um, so you work at it to make that happen? You actively seek out contrary views? Um, I do, yes. Um, be, well, contrarian views that are not toxic, so whether I have right. my bias... <laughs> nice contrary views. And I think, I think, to your point, uh, it's an evolution. We are being aware of that, and we there's pressure on the platforms, there's pressure on, on actually the big media to ensure that they're not creating their own filter bubbles, because, you know, when we didn't have the maturity of, of what AI can do and the, the effects that it can have, it was all about engagement, it was all about more clicks, because that's what the business model was, it was advertising. Uh, we're getting more maturity as an industry, and in that sort of sense, we're not where we need to be, but at least we know what are the problems that we need to fix within, within that sort of ecosystem. So, continue, continue. Yes. Thank you. So, I'm um, Jack, I'm from UCL, just to your point about... Um, <laughs> yeah, I work there too. So. We didn't have a eugenics <laughs> faculty, but we did indeed have a professor of eugenics, which I think... You know, the that's, that's, that debate, we, that's debatable, by the way. <laughs> we, might, yeah. we might learn, though, something about, about scientism there and the, you know, the dangers of framing these, these debates in scientific and technological terms. So I want to make the, the case against ethics. I think ethics is a real problem in this. Not that we shouldn't be acting ethically, but that we can trust in a framework based around ethics to be able to sort out these problems, which are we're starting to recognise of enormous scale and, and, and scope. Um, and ethics, I mean, there's a bit in the notes here about how the tech companies themselves have been very quick to embrace ethics and yeah. self-governance as a mode. And, I mean, you would, wouldn't you, yeah. if that was your business? But what I think it stops us from doing is paying any attention to real questions of politics. And I think if we start to see AI as, as power and, and think about the political economy of it rather than just thinking about the individual system, situations in which it breaches 
individual rights, then we <coughs> get a sense of the scale of response required. At the moment, you know, we are letting the tech companies make the big decisions for us, and until we get past that... But is, you, is, your, is your point that you're against, you want to make the case against ethics because you think ethics is a piece of virtue signalling by these companies, or because you think that ethical frameworks don't really apply to power plays and data? Well, so I, I'm against the, the mode of ethics as it's been deployed in the tech debate, which is about saying, we, the nice people, the tech companies who you trust, can, can just act ethically to sort out these problems. So right. the idea that we will we will trust good behaviour. And it, what it's done is, is just postpone regulation, lockdown oh, regulation. Okay, okay. And the sort of lawmaking that, that John was, okay. was talking about. Very good point. Actually, I'm going to, so I'm going to come to you now, Alexandra, but I want to ask you about this because we had this exact debate about whether or how we include ethics in the index. So, okay. so my name is Ajit. I have two comments. Firstly, uh, again, kind of a pro AI view of the world, uh, which, which I think we need to be interjected into this conversation. The first one is that most people forget that AI will be better at, than humans much more faster. If you want to understand that, think about Google Translate. Uh, yes. yes, I mean, a few years ago, nobody trusted it. Soon embassies erupted it. Everybody's using it now. Yes, so it has effectively become better than human uh, ability to do the same function. And I think in that sense, much of what we are trying to describe is a point in time discussion. The second point is about the case against ethics, and I would like to make that as well, uh, but from a more generic point of view. So what I try to think about is ethics today uh, is driven by things such as religion. Yes? Things that, sorry, I just... Such as religion. Yes. Yes? So religion is a man-made, literally man-made, enforced set of doctrines um, over, over years. Yes? So if you take that as a framework to judge AI, I think we are choosing the wrong framework to judge AI. And I think that that has to be a question that what against what are we judging AI? Mm -hmm. Because human beings are an ultimate platforms as well. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So I think that is what I would like to interject into the conversation. So, so if, you, if you don't use an ethical framework because mm -hmm. it's derived from the world religions, what's the framework that you do use to make judgments on AI outcomes? Well, I think that's a, that's a broader question. That's a broader question. But my point I'm trying to make, and in, even in this conversation, is it seems to be very simplistic to judge AI against a benchmark which we are accepting today. And I'm questioning the benchmark. Okay. Um, Alexandra, I, the reason I wanted to ask you is when, when we did the index, we had a discussion about whether or not there should be ethics of AI. Just talk us through the... <laughs> the, the, the process of how we how we got to deciding not to do that because, because it's very hard to. <laughs> 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 it was laziness mostly laziness yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. <laughs> okay um, it, we, well, just to go back a step and we spent the, it, the global AI index was was a big project it was very hard to do and we did consider putting ethics into the index because it's important. It's one of the essential questions of today of how, how this is managed. But we, we decided that it was actually so important that it probably should have a standalone index. Uh, and we needed to give it more thought. You know, what, how do you measure this? Is it the presence of a framework? Is it a state framework? Is it guidelines that are Im implemented at the, uh, at the company level? And how do you measure that? And you may be able to measure all of this and the repercussions of this use and, and lack of data protection. But to Priya's point, the back door is there, right? So you can, you can have a, a, an ethics index that might be ethics washing but, uh, and say that systems are good or nations are good or nations are full of companies that have ethical footprints in the private sector that we hope are going to produce some more ethical outcomes, but, we, but it won't be a guarantee. So what we ended up doing when we, we worked for about a year on the Global AI Index and, and decided to make that exclusively looking at the capacity and the activity going on in AI. So looking at where is the activity forming, how is it forming, why is it forming, what are the ecosystems that uh, are present in, in, in countries on AI in terms of innovation and also capacity. So to James' point, looking at the preparedness. And when we launched in, uh, the index in December, on December 3rd here in this newsroom, the question came up right away from the room, what about ethics? 
And I very happily said to James, yeah, well, that will be the next index, and mm -hmm. we'll build it right away, mm -hmm. and we'll have it ready. But, you, but it is a, it's a very thorny, it's a very thorny uh, issue. And how do we, what are the pillars? I mean, we look at the IEEE guidelines. We, we look at uh, you know, countries that are putting data protection in place. We look at all kinds of areas in which ethics are being considered and how. And, and so we are going to go into this next phase of really taking a closer look at how do you and what metrics do you wrap around to build the best possible uh, index on, on AI, but are still at the risk of the ethics. And, and Alexandra, I just want to follow up on that. I'll come back in one second. So, but there was one, one of the elements that was really interesting, at least in our discussion about it, was the extent to which high trust levels, social trust levels in AI, were seen as a, a leading indicator of AI capability. Adoption. Yeah. And therefore, if you like, the states that are likely to lean into regulation, intervention, some form of FDA, are going to be seen by the investors in AI as the ones that are going to be most obstructive and are therefore going to prevent development of national capability. So how much do you think the, if you like, the ethics argument is going to be a proxy for breaks on AI investment? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, interesting. I'm just to go back to unpack, and we don't. I don't. I think we actually have that trust in AI uh, table up there. Mm -hmm. If you can, um, I don't know if you can see. Um, interestingly, the biggest bubble. I, I, if you can't see it, is, is China. China has the highest trust in AI. Uh, and uh, can I ask about yeah. the methodology? Of this? Yeah. Um, we, but this is Ipsos Mori's, uh, this is not our own data on... Okay. on uh, because there was a study that came out uh, based on people's trust in AI that was widely reported in the media that methodologically is incredibly unsound. Yeah. Uh, re really unsound, particularly with regard to contrasting different countries. Because if you look at the way the data was gathered from different countries, first of all, we're looking at very small samples. And second yeah. of all, the samples yeah. vary wildly from country to country, and the methodology of gathering the data was very wildly. So, so I hate to be critical here, but I am going to be critical. Uh, there are a great many studies out there about this kind of stuff that are highly methodologically flawed, which is, is connected to the idea of data, big data analysis, is effectively, if you start with highly methodologically flawed data, yeah. then anal analyze yeah, yeah. it, you're going yeah. to get conclusions that... It, it, but, but the point is, I mean, no. look, we, we obviously appreciate it. One of the things that we sort of chuckle at is if you ask a bunch of Chinese people, do you trust the government? Yes. You may find that a large number of people say yes, uh, but, but, but also, <laughs> for, for very good reasons. How did you find those people? How, you know, is this a, you know that, that's a huge. No, no. But the question. point. So, but the point that I was asking Alexander was yeah. slightly a different one, which is whether or not we think that in the in the race to attract investment and skills in AI, being a world leader in AI regulation is going to inhibit that investment and skills mm -hmm. development. That, that's the. Well, exactly. Yeah. That, that seems to be one of the yeah. questions. No, and then if you look, I mean, if you if you do look at the trust, and 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 I understand, you know, surveys, and these are very small samples, sure. and and Gallup does something similar, but not sure. specific on AI. So we do take them with a grain of salt. I mean, a lot of the data that we have are are some kinds of proxies that, in the data points in and of themselves, are not, sure. you know, sound standalone. Yeah. Uh, pieces of information, but put together, they do give you a picture. And and here you see, for example, let you know, take China aside, but the Scandinavian countries are very distrustful of, of use of AI. And you you know, when you look at how does that translate into adoption rates? Because we also want to look at you know, is you know, the investment will follow uh, the areas in which where you think there's going to be high scalability and high adoption rates of AI, right? So if the regulation, because of lack of trust is going to inhibit the use of AI, you're going to have countries with low and high regulatory environments that are going to potentially see a break on investment. Yeah. And therefore, you know, that will spill into the rest of the data. Um, who have I missed? So just to, we, yeah, and, so we, we waving or just, just to I just wanted to add that I think within that whole conversation was really the key for me in that we're talking about now, what, what more do we need? Yes. And in my mind, it's, Hold the phone. We've already got enough in terms of within the criminal justice system, within the laws that are already out there, within you know even GDPR goes quite heavy-handed, and 
we you know, if you drew a scale of where we are in terms of complexity around data rules and regulation, etc., we're probably somewhere in the middle, right? And you've got China right at the very bottom, and I've spent time out there, and it is carte blanche for use of data. It's quite scary. And I think we have to be very careful not to go and put in even more cons constructs out of concern because people don't understand it, and therefore stifle innovation and really put ourselves on the back foot for, for, for growth in these capabilities. I think that point about stifling innovation, somebody made it at the launch of the AI index as well. And I think giving people carte blanche completely, you know, just do what you want, we then end up chasing with regulation and slightly naive maybe, but what I would like to see is a kind of global agreement on these are the basic things that you are and are not allowed to do. The problem is that you know if you have that with you maybe end up with kind of data havens that you have with tax. Someone mm -hmm. says, okay, well if yes. everyone's agreeing to do this, we'll let you do this if you come here. Um, but I think the kind of summary of the whole conversation we've had really is that it's about a sort of cost-benefit analysis with risk versus the potential usefulness of it. The example with the NHS, for example, I would give my data to the NHS if they were going to use it to find a cure for can cancer, but I'm not going to risk someone stealing all of my health data if it's going to help them fix ingrown toenails. Or but hold on a second, like what, if, what if you've got the risk of them stealing all your data but it could find a cure for cancer? So then I would be willing to do it. that's what I'm saying. You're, 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 you're willing to have that risk? Yeah, it's benefit. a cost-benefit analysis for everything, isn't it? That you, you have to go into it knowingly, but I think we need a global consensus on there are some things which you can and cannot do, but it's very difficult to create that. Yes. Yeah, I, I just to echo the point. I think I see a big disconnect. Sorry, Caroline's annual. I see a big disconnect between the debate in politics and the debate in businesses about how to think about these issues. So, you know, the EU Commission spent sort of 15 months, sort of talking with all their sort of 50 people, talking about ethics, and then at the end of they talk about the practice and how do companies actually do any of this. So I work with a lot of different AI companies. It's incredibly confusing about. What, how they take from what politicians are arguing about on ethics and what they should actually do in their business. A really interesting solution to this is Quantum Black has recently tried to come up with a, a protocol for practitioners around how they sort of do a risk management process for you know people who are building this stuff and you know and you can look and they're trying to open source this. So they want lots of companies to sort of play around with how do you think about risk management, how do you think about the problems of bias. And what, and what, and what kind of things do you do? So, yeah, just go on. So, what so, they, so basically they did a brainstorm at, um, at the AI for Social Good session. There's a PowerPoint online about it. And I think it's a really interesting initiative from if it becomes not just a company-specific ethics sort of board, but actually a process from the ground up about how do you build yeah. these things ethically as a better solution to regulation and waffle at the kind of government level. Yeah, sorry, yeah, it sort of builds on both of those points, really. Um, I think there is a real risk of seeing government as the panacea for the solution here. Um, government is not built to legislate for the time frame that we need to be able to um, allow innovation to thrive alongside the legislation. So we need to completely rethink either rethink how government works in order to be able to, uh, to legislate in pace and allow the freedom we need, or look at alternative solutions, and I think the Quantum Black one is a great one, where you have open source agreed methodologies of design that can then um, be adopted across the industry. You know, government is not going to be the panacea here. Yeah, yeah sorry. Ben, can come back in the room, come to you, um, So I think one of the really positive things in the AI machine learning field uh, that could be very helpful is something called differential privacy, which is the idea that in order to participate in some of these huge studies or huge AI things like uh, looking at medical record data, I participate by a tiny bit of AI running on my, say, smartphone, and mathematical conclusions about that data leaves the phone, but my data doesn't. This is different to anonymization. Anonymization is suck everyone's data in the world into a big database where it can still be sold to advertisers and then potentially do some AI on top of it, which I think is where a lot of the really unhealthy stuff that Robert's an expert on is going on. If we started moving to a world where it says, well, I will participate in some of these things, but the gateway is not I give you my data and trust you to look after it. The, the gateway is I have a little enclave in my phone or my laptop where your AI can run, and I, I remain in control of my data. 
that really starts to make quite a lot of the issues go away. And these technologies aren't, are catching up fast with their performance compared to some of the approaches that we've, that we've used in the past. But it's going to be really difficult to make the swing for, with corporates <coughs> to say, we want you to stop collecting this data that you find easy to monetize. You can still achieve your objectives, but you need a new business model that underpins it. That, I think, is some of the things that maybe not governments, but supranational organizations could start to put pressure on. But we'll never get <coughs> to your point about a global agreement. We'll never get to a global agreement on it. We can't even get to a global agreement on nuclear weapons. Sure. So we definitely aren't getting on that. So. I just want to pick up your point, minutes, um, um, I'm not sure I'm telling you this format is because it's private, but I can tell you it's a dub. Um, <laughs> it may not even be dub. It may not even be that, but we'll take it from there. Um, no, it's really interesting debate. I think there's two points just to make really, I, I think I agree with what you just said. That sort of data passporting, where actually citizens own their own data and can trade that. Data is a currency, as it is at the moment. The ability, as you mentioned earlier, May was mentioned about, you'd give your information if it was for a social good or a different purpose. I think that's really important, and I think that's where governments aren't going to be the regulator or the arbiter of this particular debate. I think where it is going to be really interesting is, is concentrating less on the ethics or indeed sort of trust, uh, but it's more about the value exchange. What is the mechanism by which you are happy to provide some of your data for a particular purpose? If you had that value exchange, and that could be used either in terms of businesses or whether it's a uh, sort of a, you know, a private individual to have a choice about how they use their data and how they are compensated for that, I think that's where the issue is, 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 is going to move to, and it's quite an interesting debate in terms of how you tell that forward. Okay. So, yes, three, one, two, one. So, we'll come right here, it'll be the last point, I'm afraid. To come back to that kind of enclave um, data bit, I think it's really important that we have an idea of what limits of benevolence use of data are that we keep that data basically siloed. If the data from the NHS is going to be used for something, we can't mix it with, let's say, tax data, or we can't mix it with criminal mm -hmm. record data. Um, I've encountered that lots with um, biometric data of refugees. If the police starts having access to that, being able to use that to solve crimes, you get a false positive in your statistics of refugees um, uh, committing crimes. And then you start having actually like really wrong data, despite obviously having a high amount of crime. Rate. Have a look at the Ring doorbell. If it, oh, no yeah. one's looked at the Ring doorbell yet, uh, in, in America, it's just starting here. But the Ring doorbell is owned by Amazon, by the way. Uh, the Ring's owned by Amazon, and the terms and conditions are basically we can sell this data to anybody we want. In particular, uh, collaboration with police departments is, is a big part of how they've made money in the states because they've effectively go to, go to police and say, hey, we'll give you a bunch of these ring doorbells if you, you know, basically participate with us. And so they're making deals with the cops. So it's a, it is literally Big Brother. It is literally putting a camera on the front of your house that sees everybody that comes to your house and can do <coughs> things that data that they pretty much like. The terms and conditions are unbelievably. Uh, look at what the Electronic Freedom Foundation has written about the ring yeah. Shocking. Um, I'm afraid, as you'll have seen, ding, ding dong, Agatha has crossed the line in lightning time as ever, which means that we have to wrap <clears> up. <throat> um, as I said, I think it is really based on an editorial conference. And those of you, I've got colleagues here, uh, Caroline and John from, uh, from FT Data, and, um, and you'll know at the end of a uh, leader conference, particularly at the FT, um, the editor when I worked there was the mighty Richard Lambert, who's now, as it happens, the chairman of our editorial board. But he had a brilliant gift for at the end of a conversation like that, saying, great, I think that's clear. <laughs> and then he would <laughs> walk into the corridor and try and work out what was going to be in next day's editorial. Um, I'll give you a slightly more sort of uh, directional view, but it's really mine based on what we, what we hear. I think that it's really important that as we keep going at AI, it's going to be one of the big themes that we look at, not just within tech nations, but alongside the AI index, that I think we internalise the point that in different ways, Priya, you made at the first start about how we're only going to really make progress on things like 
healthcare if we do make the most of data and your point, John, about how it can offset, you know, human prejudices and human irrationality. So if you like, starting with a starting point that is, this is an in, in inherently positive, progressive um, uh, technology, we just make sure we've got to uh, harness, it, harness it correctly. You, you then do, though, get quickly into the points I think that Rob was making. I thought that I was really struck by these two phrases, informational <coughs> segregation and digital gerrymandering, two forms of distortion that are not necessarily the things that we always start thinking about when we talk about data, but the distortions are really significant. And I think that the issue about reliability, the extent to which we overestimate the, the value of what we're getting from AI, and that it's not an alternative to human judgment, but it can supplement and better inform it. That seems to me a sensible and, uh, and obvious point. I do think that the extent to which, you know, uh, information segregation, whether or not we're seeing some kind, of, some kind of reinforcement of our existing prejudices, and the ring doorbell is a good example of that, is something specifically to worry about. But obviously, it would really help listening to you, Dave, and getting a sense of weaponization, deliberate forms of malice. I think that is a, you know, you know, prediction of passwords, hacking of meetings, you know, mimicry of email and the distortion of those trust relationships. I thought what was most interesting, though, was as a, as a room, that, that instinct that says, let's, you know, and Jane, to your phrase, let's hold the phone, you know, let's not rush into a regulatory position. The, the idea that you are going to see, I think, you know, I, I hadn't heard of this thing, Caroline, about quantum black, but if you could see, you know, practices that became norms that were widespread and didn't feel like it was just certain groups marking their own homework or even in the case of a consultancy or advisory firm trying to sell a certain kind of way of working, if that became a norm, I think that would provide a lot of you know, uh, 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 reassurance for people. The question is how widespread that is, which seems like a good thing to look into. But I guess going back to the point we made at the top about whether it's a fundamental uh, human right, privacy and ownership of data, I do sit with you, Dan, at the end, which is it is a social construct and it feels as though we're just in the process of getting to a, an agreed set of terms on that social construct. I think that May's point about cost-benefit is really relevant. It was the same point, I guess, you made, James, about what the level is of intrusion. And the reason I, I end up coming away with, a, with, a, with something that is, is, a, is an eagerness to explore a sort of uh, federal data administration, something which is not necessarily legislative but isn't a venue in which you can contest the impacts or the outcomes of usage of data and AI or computer programming, is it feels as though that's something that can move with the times rather than sets in stone a la parliamentary legislation, a set of rules that will very quickly be outdated. And I hope that it answers, I suppose, the most fun uh, element of this morning's conversation, you know, that, that Jack and Anjit put to us, which is, let's not obsess about ethics. Ethics may be a stalling tactic for actually dealing with what AI and data is really about, <coughs> which, uh, as you said, Doug, is about a fundamentally new currency in the way in which we work, which is a currency of power. And I think thinking about it in those political terms about power mm. is a, probably a more helpful framework for us going forward. So for Alexandra and I, I hope uh, that you will appreciate how much we value hearing from you and, and learning different ways of thinking about this. We're going to try and figure out what we do so that it's not just about dominance of AI, but it's about social impacts as well. I don't think we've cracked it. We didn't really get to issues about some data ownership and uh, oversight of data usage, but it was an enormously helpful thinking. I'm mean, hugely grateful for you all getting up early in the morning and coming to join us. Um, we're going to hold a series of these, one specifically actually next month on Apple following up on what we're doing this week. Um, please do uh, let us know what you think. And one final point is if there's something that you didn't say because you thought actually it's too early in the morning to string a sentence together, you can email me at james at tortoisemedia.com or alexandra at alexandra tortoisemedia.com. Do let us know what you think uh, and we'll try and take forward the thoughts that you've got. Uh, but for now, I hope you'll join me in thanking in particular uh, Dave and Rob who gave some real meat to the bones of our conversation this morning.